thanks everyone for listening in. And I guess this session is for the book, Simply This Moment by Ajahn Brahm. So um, my name is Ananda. I'm from one of the monks from Bodhinyana Monastery. So I was born in Indonesia. That was a while back ago. And then I spent some time over there in Jakarta. And then I moved to the US, specifically the city Ventura. If people know, you know, they live in Southern California, Ventura for uh, about two decades, and then I returned to Indonesia again for a few years, and then I come here to Bodhiyana Monastery to ordain with Ajahn Brahm. That's the short story. I don't know if you guys want to know a bit more. <laughs> okay, thanks, Manel. All right, so the book we're going to be discussing is simply this moment. So this book is covers about the first 10 years of Ajahn Brahm being the abbot of the Bodhiyana Monastery. So. Um, it's quite a long book, as you can see, it's about 400 pages. So I'm just cover probably one, two, three, four, five, six of the talks. So these are actually transcripts uh, of, um, yeah, uh, talks for, uh, I think it's mainly geared for the monastics. So it's actually quite deep. So, you know, so I ask, you know, for forgiveness if some of them might turn people off, you know, talking about things that, you know, really, really against the world. So. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is the first chapter, Ways and Means into Jhanas. Oh, I forgot, I uh, forgot. So I think if you, don't, do you have, if you guys don't have the book with you in front of you, you can download it online. So just Google simply this moment and then you can just open it up. I think people know that online, perhaps? So you guys can follow along. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, page four. The first one is, you know, it's very, very, Ajahn Brahm and early on, it's quite intense. So, you know, in first, the first uh, page four, it's already setting up the goals. So in this, uh, you know, if you've list, been listening to Ajahn Brahm, you know, nowadays, people in Ajahn Brahm try to discourage, you know, having goals, uh, you know, destinations in your meditations. Basically, just focus on the present moment, just caring for the present moment. Whereas you can hear, about 20 years ago, he actually want people to meditate hers. To be successful, you have to set goals, which is quite contrary to what he's, you know, teaching us right now. So that's quite interesting anyway. So that's how he started anyway. So I'll, I'll read you a few um, selections over here. When you have a chance to meditate, make clear what you want to gain from meditation and keep that goal in mind. The goal that I encourage is to gain the first jhana because that will equip you with an experiential knowledge of some otherworldly state. It will also train you to let go of those coarse defilements that we call hindrances. And then a few other, uh, if you keep continuing on, so you'll see the stages of meditation. So he described those. But he always, also again, these days, he discouraged for us to look at meditation in terms of stages instead of just forget about that and then just focus on the present moment. So again, this is just for something interesting if you guys want to look, you know, what, how Ajahn Brahm taught about 25 years ago. And I think this, he just continued that doing this after, until I think his uh, six months retreat when he focused on uh, the discourse of the non-self and he just decided, well, maybe meditation is much better off. You just focus on just letting go instead of, you know, setting goals, stages and all that, which is actually quite disturb disturbs the mind if you think about it because, you know, try to go, you know, this goal, that goal, and then keep continuing it. Yeah, so it's quite complicated then, so. All right, and then the second chapter I like to talk about is chapter two. It's main. It's the title. It's called "Why Tell Silly Jokes." It's mainly about anatta. It's about non-self, and this is again. It's quite, quite intense. So let's see. Okay, page 25. 
uh, what do I take myself to be? Sometimes people have so little confidence in the Buddha that they even think they completely abolish the view that self is identical to the body, or the self is in the body, or the self controls this body and ours. The Lord Buddha said in the Satipatthana that you should really look at this body and say, is there anything in here that I take to be self, that I take to be me, that I take to be mine? Don't come to a conclusion too quickly. This is why early on in my practice, I very quickly discarded the technique of asking, who am I, who am I, who am I? Because straight away I saw that who am I was implying that I was something or someone. It was the wrong questions to ask because implicit in that question was the assumption that I was something. I was not quite sure what I was, but it was something. My way of developing insight into anatta was to ask myself, what do I take myself to be? The question, what do I take myself to be, was seeing in the realm of perception, cognition and view, what I actually thought I was, what I believe I was. I was uncovering layers and layers of delusion, and as I watched this body, I saw how I thought about this body, how I view this body. Sometimes it shocked me to see that after all this year's practice, having read all this and having given talks about anatta, I was still taking this body to be me, to be mine, to be self. And page 27. Uh, this one is, he talks about perception is not yours. It's interesting, especially when we develop deep meditation to notice how random perception is. Why, of all the available things to be perceived, do we choose this and not the other? We can see that we are creatures of habit. We perceive according to habit. We perceive this way and not another way because of so much habitual conditioning. Our race, our gender, our upbringing, our experiences all make us choose from the self of available options, just one or two, or two. So often people choose the same options. It is like going to a supermarket shelf where there are so many different sorts of breakfast cereal and yet choosing the same one or two brands. Every time we look at the mind or the body, we accept the same perception and miss so much more. That's why deep samatha meditation, especially jhanas, blow away those habits. Instead of always taking the same breakfast cereal from the shelf in that simile, after the experience of jhanas, we try others. We see the all products on the shelf and we know how this whole thing works. Our mind is wide and deep and so powerful that we can do all these things. And on page 30, I guess if you guys have the book with you, sorry for skipping so much. <laughs> and then this is where, this is always like the um, Ajahn Brahm's teaching. So you always focus on the, the will, on the doer. And this, you know, it's basically where, this is where the delusion kind of originates. So all the controlling, so it happens here. So I'm just gonna read a passage here. That which does, the doer lies very deep inside us. I focus on this choice and freedom because it is a deep part of the delusion of self. It is the reason our Western world, in its delusion, fight for individual freedoms. As if there were any individual freedoms. The freedom to choose, the freedom to be in control of our affairs is just a delusion. How many people are really free in the West to choose what, we, what they want? How many people are completely in the power of advertisements, cultural inducements, peer pressure, conditioning from their youth or from their past lives? How many people are truly free? The answer is only fully enlightened people. The choices that we make and the decisions that we take are wonderful things to focus on. Watch yourself choosing to move your legs or choosing to scratch yourself on the cheek or choosing this word or rather than another word. Who's doing, what's doing this? Where does this come from? Where does this originate? What chooses? Please never say who chooses because that implies of being in there somewhere. What chooses? Where does this arise? To be able to see that, you need a very quiet mind. (laughs) 
again. So that's an example. Why why did she choose to press that button? Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so these are the things that I contemplate again and again. We said that there's no one answering this question. It's just just mine, not a thing, not a person, just a process that we choose. Look closely at choice because from choice we get control. Choice is attachment. Control is craving, and it's what creates samsara. You can't be cho- choiceless. That was one of Krishnamurti's many mistakes. Choiceless awareness. He chose to be choiceless. Choice is there. Chaitanya exists, but we need to see its causes. When we see where it comes from, realize it's not coming from me. It's not coming from a god. It's not coming from anything. It's just causes and conditioning. There are many reasons why I talk like this. If you want to know why I tell silly jokes, it's because my father used to tell silly jokes. It's conditioned, so don't blame me. Once we start to see all this, we understand about Sankara not being a self, not being me or mine. If it's not ours, we can let it go. That's the test to find out if we're truly seen anatta, non-self. Okay, so I think um, we're gonna go again, skip again, Quite a, quite a quite a few chapters. So we turn to chapter four on page fifty-nine. So the title is of the chapter is uh, "Looking for the Sweet Chili, Seeking Happiness in the World." If one can give a life description, it it is just pursuit of happiness and the running away from pain and suffering. However, although it is the case that people and all beings in samsara pursue that happiness, they very rarely find it. They seek pleasure and happiness, but they just encounter suffering. This is the truth of life which I have come up again and again and again, both in my own life and the lives of people I have met, spoken with, and spent time with. We see that the whole world is just seeking happiness, seeking pleasure, and very rarely find it. Very often the pleasure that people seek is an empty pleasure, a false pleasure. We're like sheep following each other. When all the sheep commonly agree that this is pleasure, everyone goes along with it. No one ever calls a bluff. No one investigates what they feel. Um, I recall that in my life, I've always asked questions. Questionings and probing leads to real happiness. Questionings and investigating what this life is all about questioning what pleasure is. Is this real pleasure? What's life all all about anyway? This was something that led me to a monastic life, led me to meditation, and led me to where I am now. I've sometimes given talks where I've summed up the Buddha's teaching of the Four Noble Truths into two two, two, truths. What is real happiness and how do I get it? These are basically the questions that propel human beings and animals through life, finding out what happiness is and how we can secure it for ourselves. I'm just gonna pause it. Oh, actually, there are more people came. Okay, hello, there's people from the monastery. So, uh, that was a surprise. <laughs> okay, thanks, Danny, and then May for coming, all right. Oh, and then, all right. Uh, how did you guys get here? Oh, John. Oh, okay, all right, excellent, okay. And then, I'm just gonna pause here if you guys have any questions, because I think I've been going too fast, and then, yeah, really? Hopefully it's, yeah. Yeah. If <laughs> and then, is there any questions from the, uh, from the, with online? I guess no one? Okay. No questions, excellent. Okay. Oh, yes, okay. Excellent, Anthony. Yes. Perceptions, actually, those are always intertwined. So perception is how, uh, it's actually, it's, a, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, you can, it's quite subtle, subtle actually. So if, if it's possible, it's not really necessary because perception and then conscious is quite, how would you understand it though? Uh, exactly, so 
all the five aggregates, actually they work together. So if you separate one, you can't really do that. If one is uh, gone, the other is also, you know, not long after it's also gonna disappear. So that's just the interrelated actually, yeah. So you can try to pry them apart, but I think it's not a, um, a good way, I guess, yeah. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then perception disappear, and then consciousness disappear after that. That's the cool thing. So basically, uh, jhanas is actually like this uh, gradual disappearing of the khandas. Khandas are those, um, the way we, the Buddha described this experience. So there's the body, um, as you mentioned, perceptions, will, which is Ajahn Brahm always says the most important thing, which is like um, the cause of samsara, the doing, the controlling, the manipulating. So that's why you always focus on the person. Actually, the rest is actually quite passive. The most active one is uh, the sankharas, the will. So that's always he keeps hammering on that one. So it's, uh, perceptions also it's quite nice actually. That's the only one I guess you can have a bit of control. You know, you can a bit of training. Whereas the rest is actually yeah, you just yeah, you just observe yeah things. And then perceptions you can train and just to be you can perceptions of you know letting go, being kind, being gentle. Those are perceptions actually. Consciousness, yeah, nothing much you can do about it. Just observe it, and then through perception, you can observe, you know, consciousness. And I say, oh, okay, it's just disappearing. It comes and goes. So don't take it, take it so seriously. And the will as well. That's most important. That's why, like um, Ajahn Brahm keeps saying, it's like, oh, it's not. It's not coming from a self. It's actually conditioning. Why Ajahn Brahm tells other jokes is because the dad tells other jokes, you know. So why the rest of us in uh, Bodhinyana Monastery we <laughs> also tell silly jokes is because the boss, you know, keeps you know just keep repeating it. So it's like well, after a while, you know, five years ago when I you know entered Bodhinyana, I think I says, "Well, I didn't run so he does just tell silly jokes. I'm not gonna follow that." But after a while, that's what I have a, a list of silly jokes ready for you guys if you guys don't want to listen. <laughs> anyway, so it's because of just conditionings. After a while, you just can't, can't control that. You can try to control it, but it's just suffering anyway. So, perception is the only way. So, good thing you actually pointed out. Yeah, perception, it's uh, interrelated with consciousness, uh, with, with feelings, and all that. Yeah, pretty much. You can separate them, but you can train the perceptions in a way. Look, you look at that way. So I don't know if that's helpful. So hopefully. Hey, thanks for the questions though. Yeah. And yes, May. And then I went into an intellectual trap. Right. That, okay, so we are non-self. So what is self? Uh, I understand yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Because when you say, what was your question? The question you ask yourself, who is myself? Or is that? Yeah, you? so I really resonated that, mm. you know, um, that asking what is this? Exactly. If yeah. we are not self, that is a wrong question to mm. ask. Mm -hmm. Because I went into the other thing that, okay, if I'm non-self, is it? Uh, uh, I I understand it's non-self because mm -hmm. you know this perception of self mm -hmm. is you know um, in I would call it our personality mm -hmm. is the sense of the self, right? Our, the sense mm -hmm. that we have this personality mm -hmm. and things like that and mm -hmm. this name. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but ultimately we are not. We are consciousness as an aggregate. It's, yes, you understand, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I, for me, I'm not sure whether mm. I understand it. Like, mm. So nowadays, I'm taking that, you know, I'm this personality which is useful in society, mm -hmm. and we do need to have a reference, like mm -hmm. I need to have a name, mm -hmm. right? Mm. So I do see that, you know, uh, it's okay that I have a self in the society, mm -hmm. sense of self, it's natural, mm -hmm. but I do, I do, 
nowadays I take the perception that ultimately I'm just consciousness, that we are all consciousness mm -hmm. as an aggregate. Mm -hmm. Is that still wrong view or... Does it lead to peace? If that is... Yeah. Okay, then I feel keep peaceful. going that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel peaceful because sometimes I feel like things are not going according to the way that I want mm -hmm. because the way that I want is my sense of self that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But when I look from the perception Mm -hmm. of a consciousness mm -hmm. that, you know, this is just consciousness that's running, then I feel like, okay, maybe, you know, there's a process, there's a reason mm -hmm. for everything, you know. Oh, it looks then like you're going the right way. So, yeah, keep going that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like, okay, I can let go that, yeah. you know, yeah. things are not going my way, you uh -huh. know. I, yeah, so okay. it does need to peace, but I'm not sure whether this is a still misguided perception that because Ajahn Brahm did say that when we think that we are consciousness, there's mm. still the thing. Yes, like correct. So it's a are. very tricky actually. What is more effective actually using perception is actually try to imagine. Just imagine there's no one there. So I'm going to approach that later on. So, so, but it's a cool thing. So Ajahn Brahm approaches that by imagining, you know, uh, just imagining yourself to be the Buddha. Just so I just imagine, yeah. So what we imagine, you know, if you're the Buddha. Cannot. Just imagine you're fully liberated. <laughs> and then you don't have to do anything else. Yeah, yeah. So also that that imagination works really well. So you just imagine there's no one there. So your life you can't really control this. You can't push this. So try that instead of using you know trying to asking questions. Just imagination is actually quite powerful. So when you actually imagine, you actually perceive according to reality as it is. So it's just introducing like an antivirus into the mind. Give that a shot, and anyway, sometimes it's quite shocking actually when it really works. Um, yeah. I try this a few times, no, not a few times actually, it's quite often these days, yeah, but it's amazing. So if you just intuit the this, that there's no one in control in meditation, so if there's no one in there, so, you know, there's nothing to do. No, no one, you know, no one there, just the pushing and pulling. But anyway, I'll go through all that later on. So, which is, imagination is actually very powerful. It's also a part of perception, so, you know, just, um, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if it's helpful, yeah. Any other questions? Yay. Okay. Everyone's happy? Okay. I don't know where I stopped, though. Do you guys remember where I stopped? <laughs> uh, chapter 4. Okay, actually, since we kind of short our time, so we might as well just go, you know, to uh, to the practice itself. So this is the theory because when I was mentioning about the uh, looking for the sweet chilies, so we can go to chapter page. Let's see. Do you guys want to listen to some jokes first? Because I wrote here, joke time. So, okay, the first one. We, this is from Jayako, okay? Jayako is my twin, so we ordained at the same time. And he's actually, you'll see him later on. He'll be helping Ajahn Brahmal, you know, attending his, you know, his, his sessions. And, and so his, his favorite kind of joke is like, why did the tofu cross the road? Why did the tofu cross the road? Correct, that's a chicken, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> that's a chicken joke, yeah. <laughs> but anyone has any idea? No? To prove it's no chicken. <laughs> okay, you got it, right? The chicken joke. <laughs> okay, what is a bat's motto? A bat's, you know, the animal bat's motto. His slogan. Okay, hang in there. Okay.
Okay. <laughs> okay, another one. Why did the scarecrow win the Nobel Prize? I, yo, okay, daddy has heard this. Okay, yes. That is because he was outstanding in his field. So if you guys get it. I got it, yeah? All right. What does a wall say to another? What does a wall, you know that wall, say to another wall? <laughs> that is actually a very good one. Uh, that, yeah, that's a good one though, yeah. Uh, let's meet on the corner. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is, I just read this one, okay. What's black and white, black and white, black and white, and splash? Black and white. Hey, hi, Danny. <laughs> that is very good. So the answer is Danny just got it. He's a you know a guest in our monastery. I don't know where he. Where did you get? Uh, you have you seen? But you just came out to your mind. That is, that is amazing. So yes, it is a penguin rolling down an iceberg into the water. So you can see it keeps rolling from black and white, black and white. That's, that's all. anyway. That is amazing, Danny. So I think. <laughs> All right, so, okay, let's continue with the boring stuff, which is, uh, let's go chapter 17, okay, people? So that's page 307, I know you, Mara. And this is what May was talking about, you know, the perception of non-self. So, yes, the questions is this. So we tried this one instead. <clears throat> so again, uh, I'm just going to read a selection too many people still do things. You only have to look at the sutta we are going to chant next week, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, to see that each of these khandas aggregates rupa, the body, vedana, the feeling, pleasure and pain, your perception, your will, even consciousness is out of your control. There is no self in there that controls these things. The Buddha said in an Anatta Lakana Sutta that if any of these khandas were a self, you will be able to say, oh, may my conscience be like this. Oh, may not be like that. Oh, may my feeling be such. May my pleasure and pain not be like that. The Buddha said, we cannot do that because there is no self. It is all non-self. And we do not control these things. It's a powerful statement. The Buddha said we should reflect upon the truth of anatta again and again. We, not, we may not personally have seen anatta, but at least we can have faith in the Buddha's teachings. Clearly repeated so many times that the five khandhas are nothing to do with us. They are out of control. So when, when we meditate, do we try to control these things? Or we do, do we try to push and pull the mind to be just as we want it to be, to get rid of this and to go of that? Surely we should have to get the message by now. It states in the suttas that the more we want controls, the more one is going against the Buddha's advice. So our path of practice is to be able to sit down and learn what it means to be able to let go to go in the opposite direction of the outflowings of the mind, and just to sit and be patient. And then on page 307, Knowing Mara. Mara lives in the Paranimita Vasavati realm. It is the realm where will has power over other creation, other nimittas. It is almost like the realm of control freaks. Know that control freaks within us, within yourself. Understand that Mara is a doer inside of you. He's always trying to push and pull you, saying, come on, don't get so sleepy. Come on, put forth some effort. Come on, get into jhana. Come on, who do you think you are? Come on, how long have you been a monk? How long have you got left in the retreat? Come on, get going. This is Mara. In, in answer, say, I know you, Mara. And then Mara disappears. If you don't know Mara, if you don't know what control freak within you, then you always get that tense and frustrated. Okay, on page 309, it's actually a very, um, really, really nice uh, med meditation technique. So one of the ways, the ways of developing superpower of mindfulness is by what I call total listening. Whatever you're doing, you have to be totally there because listening is an important sense faculty. Total listening is a great metaphor for this brilliant mindfulness. So whatever you're doing, you are totally listening to what's happening. Even when you are practicing present moment awareness meditation, 
you are totally there, totally listening, totally feeling. 100% of the mind is in the moment. When you understand the idea of what I meant by total listening, you also understand what this mindfulness is and how it becomes so powerful. When we say total listening, we give it everything we've got and then we find we have more to give to our mindfulness, to our alertness. We feel more gratefully and we know more powerfully and then mindfulness starts to grow and grow. It grows because we're not doing anything. The mind is still, it's not going away from total listening. <clears throat> so I guess this is a great approach though. So if you notice, if you stop right now and close your eyes and meditate, you probably notice all the chattering in the mind. So actually the mind, instead of listening, is actually trying to talk to you. <laughs> so as you can see, talking is not a great way to get into stillness. So try, try that. Just let go of that talking, that commenting, and just listen. You listen to that talking and then feel it this slowly, slowly dissipates. Try that anyway. And that's actually the secret of meditation. So be as passive as you can. Try to listen, just keep listening to those thoughts. And then, but just don't, you know, don't try to, don't try to control those thoughts, you know, those, just actually just let, let them be. And after a while, they're gone in no long time. And then after that, you can just enjoy the stillness and the bliss. Exactly what Ajahn Ram says. And it's that easy actually. And all you have to do is just listen to those thoughts. But don't participate. Which is actually quite difficult. As you can see, probably you're participating with the thoughts right now. <laughs> so anyway, try that anyway. Any questions about that? The total listenings? Actually, it's quite powerful. If you're, yes, Danny, please. I find more often than not when I'm meditating, mm -hmm. I try to listen to my thoughts and I end up going with them. Exactly. And I'm, I, I know that I have to, that must be doing something. I know that I must be interacting with them exactly. and that's not passivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm not entirely sure. I feel as if I ought to do something in order uh, to, to, this to is stop one of, doing that. Yeah. And then if you try to stop doing it, it's just going to get more and more out of control. So, yeah, that's what's going to... So instead, you do, use one of Ajahn Brahm's magic sauce, which is making peace, be kind, be gentle. So between you, while you're listening, and in the thoughts, between you and the thoughts, you insert kindness. And actually, that kindness, give that a shot. And it's surprisingly, that's... Uh, giving kindness is actually a non-doing, a passivity, a listening, actually, with kindness. And then after that, it just undercuts that, that talking. Have you tried that, using that kindness after a while? A bit of metta, yeah. 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 The metta, it just opens up the mind. So, yeah, after a while, it just settles down. Yeah. So I think that's the genius of um, Ajahn Brahm's kind of, you know, meditation technique. So it's actually quite simple. It's just be passive, keep listening with kindness and gentleness and patience. After a while, yeah. You don't participate in the thoughts again, it just they disappear. Actually, and that's yeah, the greatest challenge actually those thoughts actually if you keep participating with it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thanks for the questions, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. What time is it? Okay. Wow, actually, wow, okay, awesome. All right, Wolf, uh, question from Jim. Is there a list of books? Okay. Oh, okay. So, question from Wolfram. So, what book is this? So, again, I just want to repeat simply this moment. I don't know if you can see over there. Oh yeah, the brown one. So this, this is like the first edition. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Um, how do the mind and the feelings relate to each other? How do feelings work? Again, you can't really separate, you know, the mind and feelings. So it's just um, 
yeah, they're part, you know, part and parcel. So it's best to just lump them, you know, not to separate them. So instead, yeah. Is there a list of book which, which books will be ready online? I like to follow along if there's a schedule. Uh, yes, I think you can just Google, you know, simply this moment and you find the book online. So I think that's it. I think those are the questions right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, page 317. This is still on the chapter on I Know You, Mara. As the Buddha said in the Indriya Sangyutta, if we make this abandoning the main thing, make it our aramana, our mind state, we attain samadhi, we attain one pointness of mind. That's what the Buddha said, then the Buddha didn't say things that don't work. We make abandoning our practice by abandoning the thought that I'm in control of this meditation. We abandon all of this doing business, this measuring, this judging, good and bad, I'm going to abandon all that. And then the Buddha says, we get samadhi, we get one pointness. Try it, it works. If you got the guts to go against Mara. The trouble is we still want to control a little bit. We still want to be in the one who, who is doing this, doing this. We want to be me who gets the jhanas. We can't do that. But when we disappear, get out of the way, give up hope, all wanting, and real letting go, real renunciation, Real nekama just happens. That's what is needed. We can use anatasanya to push us, to help us push that letting go button. We fill our minds with non-self. The Buddha's teaching in the Anatalakana Sutta clearly says that the five khandas are not mine. So what is this thing we're trying to control? We're trying to control things that just that belong to us. So get us, just get out of the way. No wonder you get frustrated. No wonder suffering comes. We are trying to control things that aren't ours. We, what do we expect but suffering? We are doing things that are absolutely stupid. This delusion is so intense with many of us. You keep on meditating, and then you complain to me that it's not working, and you're fed up. How can there be suffering for us if we disappear and there's no one left? It's not suffering anymore, it's just cause and effect. The world coming and going, the five khandas going around. Now they're happy, now they're sad. There's no mental suffering left when we let go and disengage. We disengage from samsara, we disengage from the world. The five khandas are just the world of the five khandas. Nothing to do with us. There are khandas, that's all. It's just like the weather, storms, rain, wind, and then sunlight, and peace again. It's cold, and then it's hot again. You can't control these things. So why don't you shut up and just argue, stop arguing with nature? Stop arguing with the nature of your body, the nature of your mind. You know what I mean by arguing. It's the argument which keeps on saying, come on, get in there, do some meditation. That's not good enough. That was a good one. Come on, the next one will be Good, good one. Come on, meditate longer. Don't sleep so much. Do it this way. You're arguing with nature with your non-self. Forget all of that. Abandon, let go. Sit there and do nothing. And you find that the mind does not does start to become still. Anyone has any questions about this? This is how actually imagining the you know the non-perceptions, you know, how it works. So imagine there's no one there. Yeah, just imagine, you know, no one's pushing, yeah, no one pulling. So everything becomes, everything just settles down. No questions? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we just this is going to be the last chapter I'm going to go go through chapter 18 page 327 between the observer and the observed
Okay, actually page 328 at the uh, close to the very bottom. We all know the Buddha's teaching on meditation if we read the suttas. According to the Buddha, in essence, meditation is all about overcoming the five hindrances, suppressing them, smashing them to get the two dijanas so that you can see the way things truly are. Meditation is suppressing the five hindrances. But what has mindfulness has to do with the five hindrances? The path can also be described as abolishing and smashing the kilesas, that is greed, hatred, and delusion, or loba dosa moha. The Kruba Ajans always talk about greed, hatred, and delusion. Here we don't mention those things enough. Certainly in my days, as a young monk, every talk would drum into you, greed, hatred, delusion. There wasn't a talk where it wasn't mentioned 10, 20, 30 times. The point is, where do greed, hatred, and delusion live? Where do the five hindrances live? Do they live in your body? Do they live in the food that you eat? Do they live in the bricks you lay, or in the broom, or the leaves that you're sweeping? This is an important point, not only to your success as a monastic, and to your harmony with friends and other monks, but also to your progress in meditation. Those hindrances do not live in the broom, nor do they live in your, in your mind. They live between you and those objects. It's that space between the observer and the object that needs watching. It's not what you're doing, but how you're doing it that is important. That is where Mara plays. That is where the five men live. This is the playground of greed, hatred, and delusion. Too often, people put their mindfulness on the object, or they put their mindfulness on the observer. Then they look at the middle, in between them, at the doing, the controlling, the ill will, and the aversion. So that's the reason I told somebody today the story of Ajahn Sumeto. When he was first at Wat Papong, he was having a hard time. And Ajahn Chah asked him, is Wat Papong suffering? Is Wat Papong Dukkha Sumeto? Ajahn Sumeto was an Ajahn then. It was, of course, obvious to Ajahn Sumeto that Wat Papong is not suffering. So what is suffering? It's, it's the, the mind suffering? The suffering was how Ajahn Sumeto was regarding suffering. At that point, he was point, adding it to unto the experience. And if we don't mind, put mindfulness in the right place, we miss that. So, in, okay, this is just another story. In the very early days, when the villagers had just discovered generators, amplifiers, and loudspeakers, there were big noise parties close to Wat Pananachat in Bungwai village. It was so loud that it would be like having a ghetto blaster playing loud music right inside of your hut. You couldn't sleep, and meditation was very hard. The noise would get, go on until 3 o'clock in the morning. And by the time they had quieted down, that was the time the bell went for you to get up. So we hardly slept when those parties were on. First of all, we complained to the villagers and said to the headman of the village, Look, we monks, we are monks, and you're supposed to be looking after us, yet there is this loud music all, all night. Please turn it down, or at least stop at 12 o'clock to give us tears. But they would never listen to us. We thought they might listen to Ajahn Chah, so we asked Ajahn Chah, can you please tell those villagers to turn the music down for a couple of hours? They would probably have listened to Ajahn Chah, but all Ajahn Chah said was, it's not the sound that disturbs you, it's you disturbing the sound. That was a powerful teaching on mindfulness. The world never disturbs you, it's you disturbing the world. It's what you put in between you and the world that creates the problem. It's not the fault of the world, it's not your fault. It's the disturbance that your delusion puts in the middle. That's about it, yeah, so for, for the book review. So I just want to point that out. So that's, um, this is related to Ajahn Brahm's, uh, one of his meditation uh, method, which is like the three emperor's questions. So, you know, so what is the mo who is the mo um, when is the most important time, which is now? Who is the most important person, the, f the person in front of you? And what is the most important thing to do? So he likes to you know, apply that to meditation. So whatever in front of you, so just put caring attention. And that's how, you know, make, put, make peace, be kind, be gentle. So, and that's just the, basically what meditation is all about. So basically, just insert just those things anyway. 
and it, it worked. This the doing just slowly you know, just stop, you know. Any questions? Yes, Danny. You talk about the um, the most important person, I guess, in mm. meditation mm. being, you know, whatever's coming up in meditation. Mm. Um, but I also have wondered about this. In the suttas, the Buddha talks about how um, the solution to the hindrances is mm. not giving attention to them. Mm. And I'm wondering how that correlates to the understanding of, you know, these things that are coming up in meditation and knowing them, knowing them as they are. Mm. Do you know which sutta that is? Um, I don't. Okay. Uh, do you know? It might be the two kinds of thoughts. So one of the ways of uh, getting out of like, bad thoughts is just ignoring them. It's, it's about the five hindrances. The five hindrances? Yeah, the nivaranas. Mm. I can't quite... Uh, just, uh, just disregard it? Is that... Uh... No, it, it's... Um... I believe the translations I've read mm -hmm. have been like, for example, with drowsiness. Mm -hmm. The antidote to drowsiness is um, by not... Um, well, actually, I'm not sure the exact translation. Okay. Never mind. Yes, from Ajahn Brahm's, um, um, uh, what do you call it, approach, is actually you, whatever is between you and the drowsiness. So you just insert that, uh, making you know that peace, that kindness and gentleness. Because drowsiness is not the problem. It's also it's not the problem of the, the mind, the chitta. So it's just how you relate to that drowsiness. So if you can be put caring and attention, actually that drowsiness won't last for a long time. Uh, doesn't last for long. So try to give that give it that give that a shot, yeah. So it's always always put kindness in between. So it's always where the hindrances play. Just it's always in the between. So if you can truly see the hindrances, actually it's just a play of the mind. It's just perceptions actually, yeah. It's just wrong perceptions, and then you know the mind trying to fight the wrong perceptions, and then try to control this and control to control that, and if and then the mind forgets that things are out of control. Those five minutes are not is out of your control as well. And you know, think you do is just yeah, put kindness, just put space, and that's the only thing you do, actually. And it's actually very hard to do, yeah, because we're so used to doing things, you know. So just do anything, but you know, yeah. But the solution is actually, yeah, just to stop, which is actually quite radical. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the questions, though, yeah. I think that's it. I'm surprised time just flies, yeah. Oh, yes. The book is available in, in the library, so I think you can approach Manel or anyone. Any of the librarians anywhere there? Yeah. <laughs> yes, enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. I think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.